Welcome back to Holiness of the Lord. Now here's a great video posted by Fair that focuses on the creation story and temples as ancient Israel would have read them. Most of this talk pulls from John Walton, a Christian Old Testament scholar, and I feel like this touches on some great insights into the seven periods of creation, especially the seventh day of rest. So I hope you enjoy. It's interesting to read Genesis and see how it says the same sorts of things that their neighbors believed in and notice how it's different. These would be the sorts of things that they would notice and probably point us to what it was intended to teach them. And if we can figure out what it was supposed to teach them, then it may teach us some things that we would otherwise miss. Uh, John Walton again. In Israel, people also believed, uh, as did pagans, that they had been created to serve God. The difference was that they saw humanity as having been given a priestly role in sacred space rather than as slave labor to meet the needs of deity, the gods. God planted the garden to provide food for people rather than people providing food for the gods. In Mesopotamia, the cosmos functions for the gods and in relation to them. People are an afterthought, seen as just another part of the cosmos that helps the gods function. In Israel, the cosmos functions for people and in relationship to them. God does not need the cosmos, but it is his temple. It functions for people. And I would add, and we, his people, are made kings and priests for him in that temple. So the temple talks about matter unorganized. And Genesis describes how the earth was without form and without void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of the God moved upon the face of the waters. Walton says this about that. In the ancient Near East, the pre-creation condition is therefore neither an abstraction nor personified. In Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia chaos, that is uncreated matter, unorganized matter, uh, is personified only secondarily in the conflict myths that recount jeopardy to the created order. In this literature, the threatening creatures must be overthrown and order reestablished. So in Mesopotamian religion, there was chaos and the gods had to impose order on it. And that's exactly what God in the Hebrew scriptures and in the Old Testament does. He starts out with matter unorganized and he imposes his own order on it. Um, continuing with him, it would, per would perhaps be best to use terminology such as pre-cosmic condition. Oh, how can we? Oh, right there. Uh, there? Sorry about that. The pre-cosmic condition was not lacking in that which was material, that is, there was matter, but it was lacking in order and differentiation. Clever boy, that Joseph Smith. Thus, the accounts regularly begin with a pre-cosmic, unordered, non-functional world. Creation then takes place by giving things order, function, and purpose, which is synonymous with giving them existence. Once established, the order that exists in the cosmos is constantly threatened with being undone. As a result, creation is not restricted to a one-time event. You can see that in King Benjamin. He talks about how God created us out of the dust and he lends us breath from minute to minute, right? That at any moment, we, we depend on God's goodness for our ongoing survival. It's the same kind of idea that chaos is always pushing in and only God's power holds it back. As a result, uh, creation is not restricted to a one-time event. Whether the jeopardy derives from the cosmic waters, from what we would call natural occurrences, or from supernatural beings, from human behavior, or simply from the darkness of each night, the gods in the ancient Middle Near East are responsible for establishing order day by day and moment to moment. That's an Egyptian chaos. That's the uh, nun, or na, represented the primordial waters. Water for in this culture was chaos. You know, you couldn't control it. It was violent. It was unstructured. It was frightening. And there you see a 16, uh, a woodcut from the 1600s. You can see the name of God in Hebrew up there, and he's pulling order out of the, the water at the bottom, out of the chaos. And Noah's flood was seen in just those terms. Oh, here, sorry, here we go. So this is how the Hebrews thought about the world. You had the primeval ocean, that's chaos. You have earth in the middle of it. And then up top, you have a solid dome called the firmament. And then there's water up above it. So the firmament holds back the chaos and the earth holds back the chaos. 
That's why when uh, Malachi says, prove me now herewith, if I will not open you up the windows of heaven, that's because that's literally how they thought of it. The water was up there, and if you're living in the Middle East and you need water for your crops, well, God's going to open the windows and the water is going to pour down. And that's probably why the gospel writers emphasize that Jesus can calm the waters. This isn't just a miracle story or ability. They're showing that Jesus can impose order on chaos, just as he did in the beginning of creation. This, like almost nothing else, demonstrates his link to God or to being divine. And he can calm the chaos in our lives as a result. So the matter's unorganized. That might mean it has no physical form or shape, but it may also simply mean that it is merely matter. It has physical existence, but it is not yet serving a purpose for God's goal, which is the exaltation of his children. So he sets out to create, to organize a system or a process to accomplish his designs. And this is where the temple and the Genesis begin. Ontology, says Walton, that's a fancy word for existence, in the ancient world was more connected to function than to substance. In other words, something exists when it has a function, not when it takes up space or is a substance characterized by material properties. This applies to everything in the cosmos where various elements come into being when they are given a role and function within the cosmos. That is creation in a Hebrew worldview. The neglect of curiosity about the physical structure of the cosmos among the ancient Hebrews and others is therefore not simply a consequence of their inability to investigate their physical world. These people weren't stupid. They were just worried about different things than we were. The physical aspects of the cosmos did not define its existence or its importance. They were merely the tools that the gods used for carrying out their purposes. The purposes of the gods were of prime interest, interest to them. In the ancient world, to summarize, something came into existence when it was separated out as a distinct entity, given a function, and given a name. That is creation. So, with that in mind, let's look at the creation story. Day one, light and darkness. People have often puzzled about this a great deal, because how do you make darkness? If there's no light, if there's nothing, well, isn't that pretty dark already? How do you divide light from nothing? But once you begin to see what kind of a creation we're talking about here, we realize that this isn't probably talking about the creation of light as a wave or a particle or a photon. Instead, it speaks of dividing a period of light from a period of darkness and labeling one of them day and one of them night. And it's called the first day. God is creating a stage, if you will, for mortality. And the first step in that process is to create a way of measuring time. Mortals are bound by time, by days and nights, weeks and years, seasons and centuries, and God is not. Number two, back to this picture. The water and the land are separated. Remember that we began with the waters, which are chaos and matter unorganized, and it's all the same stuff. Here God pushes back the chaos and sets out a physical place or stage on which mortality will occur, complete with weather. He places the firmament, that's that solid dome for the sky, to hold the waters back from the earth. Remember, he's using their science and their understanding. So the stage is getting ready. Life needs a solid place to live and grow, and waters from above and below. Number three, fertility and food. On day three, God separates the non-living from the living. Remember, in Hebrew creation, you divide something, you differentiate it, you give it a purpose, and you give it a name. So we've taken chaos, and we've got, sorry, we've taken light and darkness and separated them. We've taken water and earth and separated them. Now we're going to separate living and non-living. Uh, he, he creates the non-living things and then the living. Plants grow from the earth, fruits and seeds, which are the basis of the food that all of us eat, including the ancient peoples. So the differentiation proceeds. You've gone from timeless chaos to timed order and now from lifelessness to life. So to summarize, days one to three, which concern the three core function of the cosmos, time, weather, and fecundity, that's a fancy word for fertility or bringing forth, would consequently be viewed not as just activating, but establishing the control aspects of the cosmos. Day four, 
the lights in the heavens. So people have puzzled about this. So on day one, God creates light and darkness. Well, on day four, he gets around to creating the sun, the moon, and the stars. That doesn't make much sense, does it? Where's the light coming from? Well, that's a logical scientific question to ask, but that's a weird question to ask. That's not what an Israelite wants to know. Oops, sorry. Remember, Israelites are living amongst and beside a pagan culture. And in most pagan cultures, the moon and the sun and the stars are divine. They are gods, and they're often very important gods. Here I have Ra, the Egyptian sun god, in his boat, right? I mean, uh, they were a big part of pagan religion. But here in Genesis, the sun, the moon, and the stars aren't even part of the picture until creation is half over. That's a subtle but clear dig at those kind of ideas. Uh, and they aren't even given names. They're just called lights. And that's probably because the name of the sun and the moon and the stars was usually the names of gods to the pagans. So here they aren't even given names. They aren't even granted the dignity of it. They're just lights. They're given a purpose and a function by God, but they're certainly not worthy of worship or fear. Number five, animals in the waters and birds. Well, from a, that, that's a very weird combination of animals if you look at it from our scientific point of view. If you want to go with the conventional scientific pattern, life started in the water, then moved on to land, and the birds are latecomers to the party. And whales, which it also mentions, are relatively young, certainly long after land animals show up. But that isn't what Genesis is doing. Instead, there's more differentiation going on. Where do humans live? Well, we live on the earth, we live on the ground. And we don't live in the waters, and we don't live in the air. So first, God assigns a role. It's, this is that separating again. He's separating the domains of life. There's water with fish and whales and all that that we aren't really a part of. And there's air, there's birds, maybe insects, I don't know. Uh, and we don't live there either. He's working his way up. Okay? We might think of birds flying as being higher, but that's not how it is. Uh, he's, as he divides and moves up, uh, you increase in importance. Oops, I just blanked there. There we go. Oh, it's not getting knocked, sorry. Number six, land animals and then humans. So we're getting close to humans, but we're still not there. Now we're onto the land animals. They're separated out, again, that division and separation. And then we get the creation of humanity. And humanity's role is to have dominion over everything, fish, birds, and land. Humans are set up as gods. The Hebrews would have said vice regents, you know, sub-kings. We would say stewards, probably, on earth. And remember, Adam even names the animals, which again is a, is a godly function. He's helping with creation because he's naming them. He's giving them an identity and a place in the plan. So Walton concludes, days four to six could be seen as determining the destinies of the functionaries within the cosmos. When the destinies of the gods were determined in the ancient Near East, then powers and responsibilities could be delegated. So the sun rules the day for God. The moon rules the night for God. Humans rule the earth and its creatures for God. So again, their function and their purpose are what matters, not just the physical assembly of the bits and pieces. You'll remember that Adam is created from the dust of the earth. Dust thou art, and unto dust thou, thou return, God tells them. Many Mesopotamian myths had the gods form humans out of clay. But to an ancient audience, dust and clay are not the same sort of thing, even though they both sound like dirt to us. Walton again. Furthermore, one should notice that with regard to the non-divine ingredients from which living beings were made, there's a difference between clay and dust. In the ancient Near East, clay is a means to impose form on the body. Dust cannot be used the same way, since it's not able to be molded. Clay has significance for the artistic process. Clay is not explicitly connected to death in these works, that is, these pagan works, as dust is in Genesis. Uh, they may even have thought that the placenta was clayey, and so that was the leftover creation bits of the gods. But dust isn't fertile, and you can't shape it. 
It represents our connection to death. So again, that's giving quite a different message than their pagan uh, neighbors would have had. Helaman, I think, gets this exactly right. Oh, how great is the nothingness of the children of men. Yea, even they're less than the dust of the earth, he says. For behold, the dust of the earth moveth hither and thither to dividing asunder at the command of our great and everlasting God. Well, you're less than the dust of the earth. Why? Well, the dust of the earth at least does what it's told. And humans all too often don't. And finally, we get to Eve. Remember how we've been moving up the ladder. First plants, then animals outside of the human sphere, then land animals, then humans, i.e. Adam, and finally Eve. God creates by division and separation. So Eve is the crown of creation. Oops, sorry. Much has been written about Eve's creation from the rib of Adam, and President Spencer W. Kimball insisted that that was symbolic, not literal. And, and that is exactly what we're talking about here. And as you can see, scholars would certainly agree with that because creation in Genesis of the temple isn't focused on physically making something, but on establishing their roles, their purposes, and their boundaries. Walton says of Eve, it should be noticed in this regard that in Genesis, the woman is technically built from the side of man. The word is usually architectural, and it's used anatomically only here in the Old Testament. Its anatomical use generally refers not just to bone, but to bones and flesh. One could ask then whether it was also true that all men and women are to be viewed as two sides of an original whole. All of this suggests that the dust rib element is significant not primarily for the individuals, but for the archetype, that is the symbol. Every man is made from dust and every Probably just on a timer. Ancient Near East anthropology suggests that Adam and Eve should be understood in archetypal terms, stressing the elements of connectivity that are inherent in their labels. All people are connected to the ground and are mortal. They're made of dust. All men and women are connected to one another, the rib, with stronger connectivity links than to mother and father. They become functional not only as images of God, but as beings interconnected to the cosmos, to God, and to one another. All of that should tell you why the law of chastity is so important. It should you remind you why only a husband and wife united in marriage can achieve exaltation. Because they are complementary pairs. They are two sides of a whole. We have all, in Genesis, in a sense, been ripped apart. And we are not whole until we find that missing half. And it should remind you that anyone who harms a woman sins against the most important thing in creation because she is the top of it all. Can't have a YSA talk without mentioning marriage at least once, right? Day seven, we're almost there. This is where God rests. What would that mean to an ancient Hebrew, God rests? We tend to think of God, I think, sitting down and putting his feet up on the, on the Ottoman. Well, that's not how a Hebrew would have seen it. As developed earlier, rest does not imply relaxation, but more like achieving equilibrium and stability. He's making a place of rest for himself, a rest provided for by the completed cosmos. Inhabiting his resting place is the equivalent to being enthroned. It is connected to taking up his role as the sovereign ruler of the universe. The temple simply provides a symbolic reality for this concept. Psalms captures this and the elements of the cosmos serve as functionaries for Yahweh's, that's God's rule. Further confirmation exists in the presence of the Ark, that's the Ark of the Covenant, in the most sacred area of the temple because it represented the footstool of God's throne. So a temple is a small scale model of the universe and the universe is what enthrones God. Without hesitation then, he says, the ancient reader would conclude that this is a temple text Again, clever boy, that Joseph Smith. He took this, this sort of stuff and stuck it back in the temple where it belonged. And that day seven is the most important of the seven days. In a material account, day seven would have little role, right? I've made all the stuff. Now I'm not making any more stuff. I'm done. But the true climax without which nothing else would make sense or have any meaning in this account. Because God rests in a temple and only in a temple. This is what temples are built for. We might even say that this is what a temple is, a place for divine rest, 
Perhaps even more significant in some texts, the construction of a temple is associated with cosmic creation. How does Joseph do it? Normal routines, once you're resting, quote unquote, can be established and enjoyed. For God, this means that the normal operations of the cosmos can be undertaken. This is more a matter of engagement without obstacles than disengagement without responsibilities. So I think God rests not in the sense that he takes time off or says, well, that's been a rough go. Uh, he, instead, he says, the busy work has been done. Now we can get down to the main event, which is to fulfill his purpose. And if you intend the temple, this is exactly what happens. God announces they'll rest, but they don't disappear. God doesn't go away or not do anything uh, or cease being involved. But instead, he comes and he instructs Adam and Eve, just as he does in Genesis. He gives them commandments, and the whole plan finally begins. You get down to business. And that should, I think, help you understand the Sabbath more fully. The Sabbath as a day of rest is not just a day to do nothing. It's to set aside the concerns and the worries and the duties that are involved in keeping the show running, worrying about food and clothing and jobs. You know, we need them, just as we need a planet with plants and animals and water and all the rest for a mortal life, but the point of them is something else. We don't live to work and eat. We work and eat to live and then do more important things. So on the Sabbath, we can fully dedicate ourselves to the purpose for which we're doing everything. So it's not a violation of the Sabbath for a bishop who may work harder on that day than any other day of the week to do the work that he does because he's carrying out God's purposes on earth.